some of the different mechanisms and how we can manipulate the immune system of pharmacology and how that can help in certain conditions and disease states. Uh, so your immune system, um, these are uh, lots of different signaling pathways uh, you have here on a T cell and different um, receptors and different mechanisms intracellularly. And the point of showing this is that we can give a lot of different drugs that manipulate it in different ways. So for example, for transplant suppression or immunosuppression in general, they use these drugs. Um, I'm going to use transplant, uh, solid organ transplant as an example of a clinical application for these medications. But a lot of these get used elsewhere too, so we'll come back to them a little bit. Um, there's some on the chemotherapy lecture. We'll talk about them a little bit when it comes to um, some of the autoimmune disorders like Crohn's disease and um, psoriasis and things like that as well. But uh, for the most part, um, focusing just on pure immune suppression and uh, solid organ rejection at the end of this lecture today, or preventing solid organ rejection. But first, just some review, so we're all kind of on the same page. Your innate immune system, uh, that's your first line of defense. You have it at birth. It protects you from um, a number of things before your adaptive system has a chance to kick in. Uh, physical barriers, enzymes, cells, macrophages, mast cells, natural killer cells, phagocytes. Uh, we're more interested in uh, the slow response, the adaptive immunity. That's the more pharmacologically manipulated thing. Um, obviously, we can't take out some of those you know, built-in defense mechanisms. We can modify some of them to a certain degree, but the uh, B cell, T cell process is a little more apt and prone to uh, pharmacologic manipulation. Um, but the adaptive immune system, so it mobilizes cues from the innate uh, system, um, and you've got B cells and T cells, humoral and cell medi mediated immunity. I'm not going to go through a ton more detail on that. I'm sure you've gotten this in various physiology classes and pathophys as well. And it's honestly not super important to the, the grand picture here, just making sure we're talking about the same thing, speaking the same language a little bit. All right, so when the immune system goes wrong, so your normal immune system should neutralize toxins, inactivate viruses, destroy transformed cells, and eliminate pathogens. A uh, abnormal immune system is going to cause hypersensitivity reactions, so that's going to usually lead to extensive tissue damage via um, things like lots of circulating vasoconstrictors, um, inflammatory mediators, autoimmunity is going to uh, react against self antigens, so attack the body attacking itself, and immunodeficiency. You know, for some reason, whether it's a malignancy or pharmacologically manipulated, you have an immunosuppressed system going on, or infectious disease related in the case of like um, HIV. Um, type 1 hypersensitivity is what you think about as your classic, like anaphylaxis, and that's going to be IgE mediated. It's mast cell and basophil degradation. You get a lot of histamine release um, and leukotriene cytokines and prostaglandins. And so this is what people think of when they think of like your throat closing, your tongue swelling, uh, like a peanut allergy that takes place very quickly. So again, we're talking about like minutes. Um, so if somebody's like, oh, I had anaphylaxis to penicillin, and I took it, and three days later I had a rash. That's obviously not anaphylaxis, right? So um, IgM, IgG complex, complexes with foreign bodies would be type 2. This is more associated with blood transfusion reactions, so I'm not super concerned about that. From a pharmacy perspective, I really care about type 1 because uh, that's going to be the most fatal for people or most emergent if uh, somebody has a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to a drug. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week as well and that, those topics when we come to like the antihistamine related therapies. And we'll talk about it a little more in emergency medicine and things like that too. So we'll come back to some of this stuff. Um, type 3 is um, the other one I care about from a pharmacy perspective. And that's like your skin drug rashes. So this would be the person who got a penicillin rash three days after they took it. Uh, that's pretty common. So elevated levels of antigen antibody complex it takes the body time to build those complexes up and to react to that. Uh, it's usually after an exposure to something new. Now, what the person was exposed to can be really difficult to pin down. It could be anything from like a new laundry detergent to um, some sort of uh, industrial irritant to um, you know a new drug that they took. You know, there's lots of different options there potentially. So, again, allergies can be really really complicated. But this is really the like the drug rash type thing that people complain about. And then um, type 4 is delayed, which is cell-mediated, two to three days after exposure, T-cell recruited response. So like poison ivy is an example of a type 4 um, hypersensitivity reaction. Again, not something that, we, that I care about a lot from a drug perspective. All right, autoimmunity and immunodeficiency, I think we all kind of know what that is. Examples, lupus, RA, MS, type 1 diabetes, Crohn's, myasthenia gravis, would be uh, diseases we will all talk about 
certain aspects of, um, some in more detail than others, and most of them not today. Um, immunotherapy is kind of an interesting subtopic that I just wanted to mention because it's a uh, it's something that's, I think, growing and it's um, used in a lot of different treatments. So um, one of the things that you can do is something called plasmapheresis. So if you have a, um, a process where you actually remove the person's plasma and you take out toxins and antigens with it and replace with the non-antigenic plasma, so some human plasma gets replaced. There's a lot of there's a lot of pros and cons to doing this. Plasma is kind of a lot of volume and it's a blood product. Um, so sometimes people prefer to use IVIG, which is IV immune globulin. And so this is something that is also a blood product. So instead of giving you plasma as a replacement, what they do is they just inject you with IV um, antibodies that have been extracted from whole blood. So there's companies out there that buy blood from blood banks or blood suppliers or plasma donation facilities, things like that. And they spin it down and isolate certain compounds out of it. Um, so you can augment the immune system for those who are suppressed. You can form complexes and cause overall anti-inflammatory effect. And honestly, we don't understand the full benefit other than that it seems to work for certain diseases. So um, we'll come back to some of this stuff, but uh, just talking about immunotherapies, uh, especially for like something like MS, has a lot of odd things associated with it. I threw it in here because I don't talk about it anywhere else, and it's just a very um, complicated disease to treat. and There's not a lot of good drugs out there to do it. You can suppress the immune system with chemotherapies and some of the stuff we're going to talk about later. And there's some special drugs there too. Again, nothing about an us will show up on your exam. I just wanted to throw it in here because again, I won't talk about it anymore else. But it's really a very, very small group of patients, very small subspecialty, and you won't see it unless you um, specifically practice in it with that population of patients. Futuristic stuff, I always like thinking about this, especially like if we kind of combine this with our, the chemotherapy information. Um, there's a product out there called Kimraya, which the, the drug company actually, Novartis, invented this process. And they take um, the patient's own T cells, they harvest them and genetically modify them using a virus and re-inject it. And um, the idea is that this new uh, modified T cell can identify the source of cancer and um, kill off the tumor of some kind. So that's where I think the future is going with. So if you hear about like immunotherapy or things like that, it's sometimes what people are talking about. Um, so that's really expensive. It's like half a million dollars, but actually if you don't get a response, the artist won't charge the patient for it. So um, still a lot of this is investigational and in research and development components, but this is one that is on the market right now. I haven't seen this done at Abbott specifically, so I don't know if we don't do this or if it's certain centers only, but we yes. did it at Park in Fargo. Oh, you did? Stanford, no. Okay. We did um, have a for our AML division. So we did it for Okay. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, yep. And that's one we use for, like, brain cancer. We'll use that one. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there that we're, we're getting kind of scratching the surface of with the immune system. But um, it's theoretical, so let's talk about more practical applications. Steroids. Okay, so steroid hormones are broken into three categories. There's glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and then the sex hormones like androgens, estrogen, and progestins. You can cross out this column completely for this test. We'll talk about these in detail um, during a specific lecture on men's health and uh, women's health topics. Uh, glucocorticoids are what we're going to be talking about the most part today. There's some mineralocorticoid applications, but for the most part we care about glucocorticoids. And glucocorticoids have tons of applications across a lot of different diseases. So I'll, we'll bring this up multiple times, like with asthma exacerbations, COPD exacerbations, and so on and so forth. So it's good to start early with these and kind of get a little bit of a handle for how they work. Uh, this really busy slide is just to show you that all um, steroids are kind of the same base. They're all represented, or they all start from cholesterol molecules and get uh, made into other forms. So you have progestins and androgens which are connected and synthesized and then uh, ultimately converted into estrogens or into glucocorticoids like cortisol or mineralocorticoids like aldosterone. Uh, so we can do things with this process too to inhibit parts of it or block parts of it as well, but um, we'll get to more of that later. What we're concerned about really are these two products. So cortisol is the body's um, natural glucocorticoid. So if you think about like a stress steroid response, that's what you're talking about. If your um, adrenal system's ramped up, it's probably going to be re releasing not only adrenaline, but cortisol as well. And that's uh, essentially, it's a glucocorticoid, but it has effects in the mineralo realm, 
and also in the gluco realm. Um, whereas aldosterone is basically just a mineralic corticoid and has more effects in the kidneys and has to do with high, um, electrolyte retention and things like that. Okay, so uh, cortisol again is a major endogenous glucocorticoid in humans, and uh, pharmacologically we call this product hydrocortisone. It's basically mole molecular to molecular structure, they're the same thing. One's just made in the lab and one's made by the body, but they're really the same thing. Um, production is governed by adrenocorticotropic hormone or corticotropin, cosyntropin. There's a number of different pathways here that, again, I'm not going to get into detail on because personally I don't really care a whole lot about it. Uh, but the point is more stress, you get higher amounts in blood, uh, increased blood glucose and enhanced glucose uptake, and you curb some non-essential functions in the body. So you get that fight or flight response, giving your body more fuel to have available to it and uh, stopping some of those processes like your rest and digest system from uh, acting at that time. Uh, so again, we talked, I mentioned this a little bit, that your adrenal gland um, signals some sort of stress response signals it, and you end up with a release of uh, glucocorticoids through some various different processes here. Um, Short-term stress response is fine. There's really no problem. The body can handle an uptick in cortisol occasionally. It's where people get these long-term stress responses where you see negative effects of cortisol. Um, where you get um, hemodynamic changes and in instability, so fluid retention, increased volume and in blood pressure. So somebody who's, well, let's say, chronically, maybe in heart failure, where their body's sort of chronically stressed is going to be releasing more cortisol than somebody who doesn't, and that can sort of cause a negative um, cycle with how their body responds to it because it's going to change their hemodynamic profile where their body can't compensate. It's trying to compensate, but ultimately it does more harm than good over time. So um, corticosteroids, there's a fine balance between how they work in the short term, and that's a good stress response that our body has evolved with and needs. Um, and then we have a long-term stress response that, again, can cause issues over time, especially in the metabolic realm. So glucocorticoids, uh, you might hear them called glucocorticoids or corticosteroids, or a lot of times when people say, let's give this person steroids, this is probably what they're talking about is a glucocorticoid. Um, again, there's lots of applications out there that we'll touch base on throughout the year. Uh, mostly affect cellular immunity and uh, cytotoxic to certain types of T cells. There is a receptor <clears throat> that uh, is designed for steroid hormones to interact with. Remember, cortisol is our natural endogenous substrate. So if we give steroid hormones, we can manipulate that. We can give ones that are more potent or higher doses or whatever we want to mimic that type of response. And uh, essentially what they're doing is they're interacting with the receptor. It's a G-protein couple type reaction that causes a downstream effect, and you end up with a uh, change in the cellular activity that causes uh, the suppression of allergic and immune and inflammatory responses. Uh, ultimately, this does cause problematic adverse effects, right? We've just talked about long-term stress response. So when we use corticosteroids or glucocorticoids for the short term, for beneficial reasons, we want to make sure that we're using them short term. Chronic steroids have their place in certain therapies, but it's not ideal. So we try and get around that if we can. All right, this just shows, um, if you've ever heard the term NSAID, which we haven't talked about these drugs yet, but ibuprofen or Advil is an NSAID. Um, NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So what NSAIDs do, and I'll talk about this a, a bit next week too, is they inhibit an enzyme called cyclooxygenase, which is a precursor, uh, or it's an enzyme needed to convert a precursor, I should say, into different types of prostacyclins and prostaglandins. So basically it's responsible for making a lot of inflammatory mediators in your body. And um, what we do with NSAIDs or ibuprofen is shut down that process, and it decreases inflammation, decreases pain, everybody's happy. Um, corticosteroids, the reason why these are called non-steroidal is because they work as an anti-inflammatory, but they aren't a corticosteroid. Where corticosteroids also cause a, an anti-inflammatory effect, it's not the only thing they do, it's one of the things they do. It does decrease the protein synthesis uh, that you might see in some of these cells here, uh, responsible for per, um, producing cyclooxygenase hormones, and therefore you don't get that same effect. So it does kind of have a similar effect to, to NSAIDs and how they work, which is why people use steroids for pain syndromes, uh, because they're effective for that. 
Okay, so what does this have to do with the immune system? We're kind of talking about anti-inflammatory and immune system, and it's all getting sort of muddy. And the point is they sort of run hand in hand, but they are different. You can have anti-inflammatory effects that don't touch the immune system. You can have immunosuppressive effects that aren't anti-inflammatory. But corticosteroids write a fine line in the middle, and they do both. And that's really the point of this slide here. All right, so let's talk about, fortunately for everyone, there's not a lot of corticosteroids on the market, and there's a couple nice buckets you can put them into. Uh, so this first uh, section here shows short-acting drugs. So hydrocortisone, we talked about this, uh, comes oral, parenterally, and topically. So you can give it IV, orally. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And again, this is most similar to our endogenous steroid hormone, cortisol. So it's got a one-to-one -one mineral to glucocorticoid potency. So it's going to do both in the body. Um, fludrocortisone is the only, well, I didn't talk about aldosterone here, but we'll leave aldosterone off the table for now and come back to that during um, cardiovascular. But fludrocortisone as a drug is a, basically a pure mineral of corticosteroid. And we use this for certain things like people who have um, chronic uh, hypotension, if they get uh, orthostatic hypotension, like when they stand up, they lose their blood pressure. Um, if they have uh, electrolyte imbalances, sometimes we use fludrocortisone, so there's a couple different applications for it there. Uh, don't worry about it really right now. I, I just want you to know that fludrocortisone is not a glucocorticoid. That's the message from this lecture right now. Um, intermediate acting drugs, methylprednisolone, prednisolone, and triamcinolone. Um, prednisone's not on here, but it's basically the same thing as prednisolone. They, they, one gets metabolized into the other. Prednisone's probably the most common oral steroid that people will use. Um, and methylprednisolone's probably, well, and dexamethasone too, are probably the most common IV steroids people will use. So really, um, you're looking at drugs that get commonly used in clinical practice being more on the glucocorticoid side of potency. And again, that's the one we like to manipulate more pharmacologically for its immune suppression effects and its anti-inflammatory effects. We don't really want the mineralocorticoid effects as much if we can avoid it because we don't really need them for the purposes of why we give glucocorticoids in most cases. So that's why hydrocortisone is, has limited applications compared to its more glucocorticoid potent friends. And again, we'll talk about this more. But for like a steroid burst, somebody's like, oh, let's give a steroid burst. Or has anybody heard of a Medrel dose pack? Maybe, yeah, so that's methylprednisolone. And steroid bursts are most often prednisone, oral prednisone doses. Um, dexamethasone and betamethasone, it's not that they're, they're more potent and we just dose them a little bit differently. So like a dose of 10 milligrams dexamethasone IV might be equivalent to like 60 of methylprednisolone. So again, there's that conversion there, but we don't, but it does give you the option to get a little bit higher of a steroid effect if you want to dose up on the dexamethasone because it's a more potent product. Um, but, uh, dexamethasone is used frequently for the same things that methylpred and prednisolone are used for, but it also has some other applications. It's used more, much more commonly in things like um, uh, chemotherapy related nausea and vomiting and some of those types of uh, niche indications where you don't see the other steroids used quite as much. All right, I just talked about this quite a bit. Um, really what we see this, what I see this used for mostly is septic shock in kids and also, well not kids because I don't really teach uh, treat kids personally, but um, for kids, that's where the evidence is. So for people who have a septic response, especially children, um, it tends to overwhelm their um, their whole stress response system, right? So their adrenal glands are kind of at max capacity. They've released all the cortisol they can. They can't push any more out. And because they're a child, their system's probably relatively healthy otherwise. Um, so they can afford to be given a little bit more steroid and uh, hydrocortisone tends to work well for them. In adults, the evidence really mixed on whether it works. So we'll talk about, I think I mentioned this a little bit with sepsis, and we'll talk about it more during critical care, but the, the majority of people would agree that it's sort of a last line therapy. So if you're trying to, somebody's in shock except from a septic source and you've got fluids on board and you've got vasopressors and nothing's really getting their blood pressure back up, um, sometimes they use hydrocortisone as sort of a last ditch effort, but um, it's usually not all that effective. I don't really care you know these ones. There is something called a cosentropin stim test that you can give somebody. And what that does is just assesses whether adrenal and pituitary glands are functioning properly. So if you give cosentropin to somebody IV, their body should release cortisol, and then you can measure serial cortisol levels to see how much they're producing. So if those come back really low, you know their adrenal and pituitary systems kind of tapped out at that point. If they come back normal, then you're like, well, it seems like they're working, so we wouldn't really give any steroids to these people. So that's if you go into critical care and see septic patients, 
patients frequently, you're going to probably use this somewhat often, but otherwise you'll probably never see that. So just put it there in case, you know, that's your career path you want to go down. Otherwise, you can probably safely forget about it. Uh, all right, prednisone, I just talked about this a little bit, um, and prednisolone is the active metabolite of it. Again, there's a lot of different combinations of uh, options you can use with steroids. Prednisone is probably the most common one you're going to see for different um, bursts and uh, steroid tapers and things like that. It's also our common maintenance immunosuppression. So people who are solid organ transplant will usually take prednisone once daily, uh, a very small dose of prednisone once daily as part of their immunosuppressive regimen. And we'll talk about prednisone and these drugs a lot more this semester. So don't worry too much about them right now. They're just kind of understanding what they are generally. Uh, methylpred, again, this is a Medrel dose pack. It also comes IV. Um, I see it used mostly IV. I really don't like Medrel dose packs because I think they're kind of annoying. And I'll talk about this probably multiple times because it's sort of a pet peeve of mine. But um, if, you don't, if you've ever seen a Medrel dose pack, it looks like this, or if you've never seen one. Uh, and so it's specifically designed that you take a certain amount over the course of a day. Here's one problem. Uh, the first dose, you could take all these at once. So what's the point of telling somebody to take two in the morning, one after lunch, one with dinner, and two at bedtime? It's just super, I don't know, it's confusing to me. Um, there's no harm with taking 20 plus milligrams, 60 milligrams of steroid at once. It's got a long half-life, so it's all just going to sit in your body anyway. Um, and then the idea that the medical dose pack is nice, it just sort of tapers itself down. But the funny thing is you don't need to taper steroids for a few days. So the idea behind tapering a steroid is because um, people will say that, well, if you give somebody steroid enough, your body will stop producing endogenous cortisol. But if you take that steroid away, you're in a little bit of a tricky situation where your body is used to having a steroid there and also it's not there and then it can't make its own cortisol. So you're taking away one of your stress responses uh, that the body naturally needs to fight infections and things like that. But in the short term, that's not going to happen. So really you have to give steroids for probably at least 10 to 14 days to see that um, system drop off. So the fact that this is a self-tapering doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You could just give them 20 milligrams of prednisone once a day for six days and call it good and be just fine. You'd not cause your patient any harm. So I think this is unnecessarily complicated and kind of annoying, especially because well, I'm on the inpatient side, so these have to be all like individually ordered specifically in an electronic medical record. Whereas on the outpatient side, you can just prescribe it this way. So I think these have kind of gotten gotten popular. Kind of, I, I call it the Z-Pack effect, where you can just write Medrol dose pack on a script, or that's what you know it was before electronic medical records, and uh, it was super easy because this was all on the package for the patient. But really, it, again, it's no different than prednisone once daily for five days. Same thing. So I'll come back to that during some steroid taper stuff when we talk about um, asthma exacerbations and COPD exacerbations as well. I do want to be clear, though. Medrol dose pack is not wrong, so <laughs> don't think. I just think they're annoying. Um, it's fine if you want to prescribe them, and I don't have any problem with that, but I do think that it doesn't really make sense from a logical so, okay, <laughs> my opinion, done. Um, triamcinolone. Triamcinolone is a brand name Ken Kenalog. Um, it's a really common topical steroid. We aren't going to talk about topical steroids at all today. We'll talk about those during Durham, kind of early in the spring semester. Uh, but it's probably the most common. It's a nice intermediate potency topical steroid. That's why we love triamcinolone. It's a prescription product, but it is more effective than like OTC hydrocortisone, and it's not as potent as some of the super, super ultra potent topical ones that we'll talk about later. Where I see this most commonly from a non-topical perspective is intraarticular. So this is like um, people are like, oh, I got a steroid injection or whatever they call them into their knee. It's usually triamcinolone. And um, they, so they formulated it as Canalog as a specific suspension that's sort of like, uh, I think it's an oil base once it gets um, reconstituted or it's kind of a thick gooey substance. And so it sticks in that um, synovial space and doesn't leach out of there too quickly. So you get a long-lasting anti-inflammatory effect. So if you go into ortho, you're probably going to get a lot of these or do a lot of these. So that's generally the drug they use. There's, there are other ones, like there are some um, methylprednisolone comes as an intraarticular form too. Either one's fine, no difference. Same, same concept really, uh, but this is a really popular one. Uh, okay, Decadron or Dexamethasone. Decadron's a brand name here. Uh, PO and IV, it's nice. It's a one-to-one -one PO to IV, so it's really easy to remember that one. Um, substitute, prednisone or methylpred. Again, it's a much more potent, but we use relatively lower doses. Same overall concept, very heavy on the glucocorticoid, virtually no mineralocorticoid effect. 
Um, yeah, you can give really large doses. Like um, uh, if somebody had a spinal cord injury and they're having cerebral edema, sometimes we give really big doses of steroids to hopefully decrease that uh, process. And that's sometimes used. I don't see that because I don't work at a trauma center that would deal with that personally. Uh, it's really popular for chemoimmunosuppression and an antiemetic. I mentioned that earlier. Um, IV onset's not quite as fast as IV methylprednisolone. So for like, uh, I'm trying to think, like an uh, anaphylactic reaction, if somebody comes into your ED or urgent care with anaphylaxis, that's probably going to be methylprednisolone is what's going to be used just because it does seem to work faster than Decadron for whatever reason. Uh, and then same thing for like a, an asthma exacerbation where you're thinking about intubating the patient. If that's your other option, you're probably going to go with methylprednisolone. Otherwise, they're pretty much apples to apples. Side effects. Glucocorticoids have tons of side effects, but most like most people won't experience them because they'll be on them short term. And if they do experience the side effects, they should be relatively short lived for a couple days. Um, psychiatric related. This is probably the most common short term side effects people will respond to with uh, steroids. Some pe people feel all over the map with steroids. It's really kind of interesting. Some people will get a, like a euphoric, almost like buzz sensation from them. Um, other people feel depressed or agitated. They're really emotionally unstable. Some people might even get like mild forms of psychosis or irritation or agitation from it. Why? I don't exactly know. Again, all over the spectrum. Most people will be just fine, so don't think everyone who gets steroids too is going to get psychotic on you, but it is possible for that to happen. Um, physical stuff usually happens over time. So like buffalo hump and moon face, I don't know why they call these them. They sound like really dumb terms, right? But it's, it's different um, ways that the body's distributing fat. So they distribute fat kind of on the back of the neck and they round out the face uh, more so than, than the normal person would look usually. Um, and so those two things can happen with uh, chronic steroid use. Thin and bruised skin is a really common thing, especially for elderly patients or patients who are on anticoagulants. Um, they're going to bleed and bruise really easily. So you see somebody who's like on warfarin or some anticoagulant and they're an older person, their whole arms bruise because like any time they bump it, it just bruises really easily because their thin skin kind of thins out a little bit. Um, decreased muscle, uh, increased abdominal fat also. So again, the lipo distribution uh, effects that it chronically are um, not not something that most people would want and also are something that um, is going to affect your metabolism over time too and coordinates with sort of those increases in blood sugars that we talked about a little earlier. Um, so I'm a little bit drilling down into some of the side effects. Uh, cell growth and division inhibit cell division and DNA synthesis. It delays our healing process. So again, it's an immunosuppressive product which is great for some conditions, but like if we're treating an asthma exacerbation, we don't really want to suppress their healing ability if they get like a wound or something like that. But that's just one of the complications associated with these drugs. Again, short term, probably not a big deal. Calcium metabolism, uh, decreased intestinal absorption, increased renal excretion. Uh, so people who are at risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis should, should be cautioned with steroids. It doesn't mean you can't use them, but especially chronic steroid use, you'd want to be careful with or at least make sure you've got them on um, some sort of supplemental therapy to help prevent those uh, conditions from getting worse. Endocrine, talked about hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia can be a, a short-term or a chronic one. Some people will get hyperglycemic on steroids even after like a day of use. I've had patients I've seen who've taken insulin, who take insulin when they're on steroids. Like there may be like, for some reason they use steroid, steroid bursts fairly regularly, be it like a Crohn's patient or whatever. And every time they get it, they, they always have an insulin uh, pen that they take and they use like a sliding scale when they um, take it because they don't have diabetes, but they get really hyperglycemic on steroids. And then when they stop the steroids, it goes away. So it does happen quickly. And over time, that can certainly build up and cause more of a diabetic-like picture, picture. So that's where the chronic point of it comes in. Uh, not everyone's going to get hyperglycemic on um, steroids, but uh, a lot of people will report increased appetite, which can, if not checked, could cause some metabolic changes. Um, just really quickly, talking about a couple steroid-related syndromes. Cushing syndrome is hypercortisolemia, excuse me. Uh, so, acido, uh, so ACTH producing pituitary or non-pituitary uh, tumor is related to this usually, or increased cortisol production from adrenal adenoma or carcinoma. So usually there's some sort of a, a malignancy-related uh, reason for Cushing syndrome. Uh, directed at the primary cause, so chemotherapy or whatever that might be, surgery. Uh, most symptoms disappear after 2 to 12 months, uh, but it is something where you're going to see 
uh, an increase in steroids, uh, cortisol production, so hypertension, osteoporosis, glucose intolerance, uh, those are all fair game. They should improve once either the condition is uh, managed or the underlying cause is managed. That's really the thing. I don't care if you know Cabergolian or Per, uh, sorry, what is that? Pisirotide. Um, I don't really even know what those are that much. We don't use them very often. If you want to look them up on your own, you certainly can, but I won't test you on those two drugs. Cushing's is rare, and again, underlying cause. It's sort of a complication of certain diseases, and you take it with stride, try and manage it if you need to. Um, but a lot of these side effects are manageable in the spare time. Again, we can manage hypertension, we can manage osteoporosis, and we can manage glucose intolerance for a short period of time while we figure out a better long term treatment. So, does it do we need to use odd, weird drugs? In most cases, no. Um, Addison's disease, so is the opposite. So you have primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, tuberculosis is heavily associated with this for some reason. A lot of people with autoimmune disease, so 70 to 90 percent of people with Addison's disease have some sort of a comorbid autoimmune disease. Um, there's a lot of other infectious diseases and malignancies um, that are associated with uh, Addison's as well. So it's sort of got a weird gamut of causes. Um, acute usually cause fluid and electrolyte disturbances. You can replace and give IV glucocorticoids to supplement. Um, usually you're just going to give the patient hydrocortisone. Remember that's our one-to-one -one cortisol replacement. Um, you could use prednisone or dexamethasone if you wanted more of a glucocorticoid effect. But hydrocortisone is um, most likely going to be uh, used for most patients. If you did use something more glucocorticoid, you could give fludrocortisone in addition to that to get the other half of it. So two drugs maybe to get a better effect if hydrocortisone wasn't cutting it on its own. And it might not. Uh, whenever we try and supplement something that's exactly what the body produces, it never tends to work as well as what the body does, right? So um, sometimes you might need something a little more potent on both of the glucose side and the mineral side to, to get the effects you need in this case. All right, uh, brief summary, basically what I want you to know for the test for this stuff. Okay, so I want you to know what oral options we have for uh, steroids, what are the common ones. So prednisone and dexamethasone are our common oral options that are glucocorticoids. Um, IV options, uh, methylprednisone and dexamethasone. Potency, um, which ones are the most potent, which is least potent. And then that fludrocortisone is mineralo only. The rest of the stuff we'll talk about might come up like in the context of immunosuppressants or um, like uh, asthma or COPD exacerbations, but uh, that's really what I want you to know from like a very basic steroid knowledge going forward. And then the mechanism of action too, and those kind of basic things as well. But as far as categorizing them, this is what I'd expect you to know. All right. Um, some other steroid applications, we'll talk about nasal sprays in the ENT lecture. Uh, and inhalers we'll discuss during respiratory, but those are two huge areas of steroid use. So I don't want you to think I'm just forgetting about them. We'll talk about them uh, in a couple of weeks here. Okay, um, let's get, let's just do a quick five minute break and then we can do immunosuppressive drugs. All right, so solid organ transplant, uh, something that you guys probably, Probably anyone want to go into transplant? Anyone have a passion for transplant? I know it's kind of an odd thing to like want to go into. Um, we actually have a small army of PAs and NPs that work with our heart failure patients and our heart transplant patients. So it's a definitely a advanced practice provider area. So I want to make sure you guys are exposed to it. Obviously, this is specialized, uh, but I do think it's a good way to highlight how we work the immune system uh, with drugs. So uh, organ transplant is a treatment of or, um, so again, why do we suppress the immune system? So we're going to talk about organ transplant today. We can also prevent autoimmune disorders, prevent cell prolifer proliferation, uh, and treat different types of cancers as well. So those are kind of the main areas. We'll talk about the organ transplant part today. Cover a number of autoimmune diseases, mostly next spring, um, specifically. Some of the, some of these drugs will come back at that point as well. Okay, so our transplant goals of therapy and stop the body from destroying the transplanted organ, host versus graft or graft versus host, depending on if you like a bone marrow transplant or a solid organ transplant. Uh, prevent acute rejection. Uh, we're going to focus kind of on kidney transplants, most common transplant done. Uh, generally, maintenance regimens don't really differ a whole lot between organs, so kidney transplant drugs are pretty much the same as heart transplant, liver transplant, lung transplant, etc. 
Um, general strategy is mix up mechanisms of action, which is a good way to approach the vast majority of things we talk about. We rarely duplicate mechanisms of action, whether we're treating, um, whether we're trying to prevent organ rejection or treating hypertension. It's basically the same concept. We look at what our classes are, which drugs we can mix and match within the class. This is a little more specific and, and restrictive in that, but it's the same concept. You want to mix your mechanisms of action and hopefully get a synergistic response that way. Um, organ transplant therapy is one of the areas where blood levels are still done pretty frequently for patients to make sure that they're within a goal range for a specific trough level so that their bodies aren't eliminating the drug too quickly. If they're, we, we get a lot of times we get like a morning trough. So let's say you take your tacrolimus, which is one of the drugs at AM, PM one day, so you, and then the next day your body before your morning dose, you'd get a trough level. So that's when the body's pretty much almost eliminated as much as possible before your next dose and then make sure that that's within a certain range. And if that's good, then we keep it going. Otherwise we increase or decrease the dose as needed. So this is one of the areas where we actually do use drug levels. Most places, now, most diseases now, we rarely get levels on medications. Um, just to highlight that. Sorry, I photocopied this from a book because I couldn't find a really good example on Google. It's like one of my Google fails. I looked at images everywhere, but I really like this one. I didn't want to recreate it because I just was lazy. Uh, so uh, some of this is cut off, but these aren't important drugs over here anyway. Uh, <laughs> the CD4 T cell uh, is really the, the target. We've already talked about this a little bit. Um, the major drugs here are broken down. So if you like to do visual learning, kind of like I always like to have a diagram to look at sometimes when it comes to where these things work and how to break them down. Um, like for example, our two calcineurin inhibitors are cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and those are uh, a backbone of anti-rejection medication. So you're on one of those two, but not both. Um, then you have mycophenolate, which is MMF here, and azathioprine, which also work with in intracellularly, and they're anti-metabolites. They work on the specific um, cell cycle and disrupt it that way. And then you have steroids, which work on the IL-2 gene to decrease IL-2 promotion, which uh, ultimately uh, diminishes the cell's ability to attack uh, foreign targets. And so you have a couple different other things on here, which we're going to mention very, very briefly. All these things that end in MAB. Uh, remember I talked about biologic drugs like a month ago? Uh, that's what these are. So MAB stands for monoclonal antibody, and those are biologic agents, injectable, expensive. Um, they work on different areas of the CD4 T cell uh, to shut it down. And so a lot of those things are done either um, before transplant to get the body ready for transplant so that you don't get immediate rejection. You're kind of wiping out the immune system uh, prior to transplantation. That's called induction. It's not done with all types of organ transplant, but it is a process that happens. Um, also, what we sometimes we use those bigger guns if somebody's getting um, rejection and their drugs are good, the levels look good, for some reason they just aren't working correctly, and we need to maybe adjust the regimen. In the meantime, you can give them a really strong, like something like alemtuzumab, which is a really potent uh, immunosuppressive agent that'll work very quickly to kind of wipe out their immune system from functioning. So sometimes, you know, you've invested all this time in this patient, uh, a lot of money too, from a financial perspective, uh, putting a new heart or a new lung or kidney in lungs or kidney into the patient, uh, you want to make sure that organ survives and gives it the best chance you can. So sometimes we do break out these bigger guns to do that. But for the most part, we're going to focus on these three cornerstones. So you've got the calcineurin inhibitors, the steroids, and mycophenolate or azathioprine, the anti-metabolites here. And from your perspective, that's really where I want you guys to focus because if you work with transplant patients, you probably aren't going to be deciding induction regimens prior to trans transplantation. I'm not going to be doing that. Well, uh, yeah, certainly I won't be doing that. Uh, maybe a pharmacist specialist might have something to do with that, or maybe you guys might be involved with that. That would probably be whoever's coordinating your transplant program and directing that specific thing. So um, we ourselves as more, I think of myself as more of a generalist, and you guys might think of yourselves more generalist too, depending on where you want to practice. But um, to see patients on these drugs in your clinic or wherever you might end up practicing, I think that's where it comes in handy to understand how they work and, and the importance of them and to see, oh, this person's on mycophenolate. That should be a big red flag in your mind. That's like, okay, if I prescribe them something, it cannot interact with that drug. That's a drug that we don't want to mess with if we can avoid. So um, I just talked about the three major classes here. They always use prednisone. I've never seen anything else used for a solid organ transplant. Uh, there's a couple other classes, uh, again, that that I don't really care about you knowing. mTOR inhibitors, we'll talk about them. These are So these are all injectable agents, the IL-2 receptor blockers and the other agents. And these are all, again, fall into that category of either used to induction. So we start this before we transplant somebody and it's like a one-time thing. 
or they're given if somebody's rejecting their organ and you need a last ditch effort. mTOR inhibitors are, are sort of a, an alternative oral agent that are a little bit of an oddball, and I'll talk about those here in a second. Let's start with anti-metabolites. <clears throat> so anti-metabolites inhibit synthesis of DNA, RNA, and proteins. They interfere with cellular metabolism and inhibit mitosis of that CD4 T cell. Um, azathioprine is the older drug. It's a historical gold standard, but mycophenolate is what every new transplant patient will be on. Uh, it's just much better tolerated. Uh, it's generally thought to be more effective overall, too, in the long-term studies, probably because it's better tolerated and people don't miss doses and things like that. But again, they're both pretty effective. So, um, for example, uh, if you had mycophenolate issues and somebody was not tolerating it well, you could try azathioprine. No guarantee they aren't going to get the same effects with azathioprine, but it might be worth a shot, especially since you want them on one of these two drugs. Um, most people just have a better chance of starting with mycophenolate first. GI effects are the biggest ones, um, especially azathioprine tends to be worse. Take it with food. Uh, any aluminum or magnesium products, so these would be like antacids like uh, Rolaids or products like that. A lot of OTC antacids have aluminum and magnesium in them. Make sure your patients are aware that they shouldn't be combining those two. Um, hematologic effects, you can get some leukopenias, anemias, and thrombocytopenias. Um, we watch this stuff and do CBCs and things like that. It's usually not enough to stop. If somebody's going to stop taking anti-metabolites because it makes them sick to their stomach and they get nauseous or they get um, really bad cramps or something like that with it. And that's where we want to work with them. So either, you know, incorporating meal times or changing the way they're taking it throughout the day or maybe trying to switch to a totally different drug. Those are options we could do. <clears throat> Calcineurin inhibitors, uh, two drugs in this class too, cyclosporin and tecrolimus. So calcineurin inhibitor, inhibitors prevent the upregulation of IL-2, which inhibits activation of your resting T lymphocytes. And cyclosporin, um, I, I don't want you to know this for the test. I'm not going to ask you different uh, formulation questions on cyclosporin, but it is um, something to, to be aware of that if you're ever trying to sub substitute somebody's cyclosporin. It is specific to the formulation. So like Sandimmune is an old brand name that is different and inferior in its bioavailability to the newer formulations, which are GenGraph or Neoral, and those are usually kind of interchangeable. But um, transplant is something that's a sort of an odd area of medicine that usually if somebody was started on um, like Neoral brand name, even though we have generic versions of that product now, they're usually going to stay on the brand name of it because people are so hesitant to make any type of change in a transplant patient's medication regimen. They don't want to risk even a subtle difference between generic and brand name. So they're like, you've been a successful kidney transplant for 20 years. We're not going to change a single thing. And there's probably good rationale for that, right? So this is one of the areas where sometimes you will see brand name only prescribed or certain formulations prescribed only. Uh, Tacrolimus is Prograf. Um, there's a... Uh, it's an older medication uh, that has gone generic, but there's a couple newer long acting. It's a twice daily medication historically. There's a couple new once daily formulations on the market. Uh, there's also an IV formulation available too, which could come in handy if your patient um, gets, you know, I don't know, gastrointestinal illness and can't take their medication for a couple days. They could come in and get an IV dose of it so they don't go into acute rejection. So having those uh, options, and I don't, I don't think I said that mycophenol. Oh yeah, mycophenolate does have one as well too. So that gives it a nice advantage where it's uh, IV available. Uh, both drugs are CYP3A4 metabolized. Remember that's one of our enzymes. It's one of the most popular enzymes for drug metabolism. So anything that interferes with CYP3A4 is something we want to be concerned about. Uh, so these drugs, the calcineurin inhibitors specifically, are going to be the most prone to drug interaction. So I think I used mycophenolate as an example, and you can slap my wrist for that. I didn't mean that. Let's use tacrolimus as our example. So if you're going to prescribe something and it is going to interact with tacrolimus, that's something you really want to be cautious about. So a good example would be like fluconazole. We just talked about um, antifungals. Fluconazole is super common antifungal. You get a, a patient who has a uh, thrush, thrush or something like that, which is really common with immune suppressed patients, and you want to prescribe them something. That might not be the best choice because it's going to severely interact with their tacrolimus. So maybe think about something topical like a swish and rinse or something like that that they could try. Um, adverse effects are shared between the two for the most part. Uh, they're both nephrotoxic, which is kind of interesting since they're used for kidney transplant. Uh, and hopefully they don't cause too much nephrotoxicity to the point where you have to um, replace the organ again. Usually it's transient and most patients will, um, will be okay with it. Now, um, this is where the, that other drug class, the mTOR inhibitor, comes into play. And I'll talk about that here in a second. 
um, but tremors, hypertension, and hyperglycemia are all shared. Uh, so if you get one on one drug, you probably won't do better with the other one. It might be worth a shot to try and switch, but um, it's a class-related side effect of calcineurin inhibition, and it probably won't do a whole lot. Uh, you could try, though. Um, cyclosporin only can cause some hyperlipidemia, um, gingival hyperplasia, and hirsutism. Tacrolomus uh, has some more um, GI-related side effects, uh, can cause hepatotoxicity in really rare cases, and uh, can have some electrolyte disturbances. Overall, uh, nephrotoxicity is the one to really remember about these ones and the drug interactions. Those are the two take-home points that I would take from this slide. The rest of the stuff, it's like, we again, hypertension, hyperglycemia, hyperkalemia, magnesium, magnesium, we can work around most of that for the, for the majority of our patients. Uh, the third preferred cornerstone of solid organ transplant is the glucocorticoid. Um, prednisone is our most commonly used steroid in solid organ transplant. Yeah, and I said that a couple times. Uh, dosed once a day. Usually start with pretty high doses, and a lot of times during the induction phase, they'll give like an IV dose of methylprednisolone that might approach like 1,000 milligrams. And then you usually get down to like 5 milligrams a day oral is the target dose for most patients. So it's a very small dose. Um, Adverse effects, we just talked about these, but those long-term adverse effects, that's where these come into play for these patients. Again, they're on small doses, so you shouldn't see it to a substantial degree, but you will see some of this stuff um, over the course of the patient's lifetime, for sure. Uh, the mTOR inhibitors, the other class that's worth knowing, uh, mammalian target of rapamycin is what this is, and it inhibits T lymphocyte activation and proliferation, separate mechanism here. And um, this is really, the, the benefit of this class is to replace a calcineurin inhibitor if you have renal toxicity. So if they aren't um, tolerating either calcineurin inhibitor, this is where they use mTOR inhibitors. Um, you could technically use it to replace an anti-metabolite too. So let's say they're doing just fine on the calcineurin inhibitor, but they're getting really bad GI symptoms on both azathioprine and mycophenolate. You could sub this in. So it's its own drug class. Um, it was historically always used as the calcineurin substitute, but you could substitute it for the anti-metabolite as well. Adverse effects are pretty minimal. Most of them have to do with blood dysgrasias and some um, lipid changes and maybe some edema. So there's no real GI side effects, no kidney side effects. So fortunately, it doesn't do what you want to replace it to do. So if somebody does have those side effects, it is a good option to try. They are kind of expensive. I think serolimus has been around now enough that long enough now that it's cheaper. Um, Everolimus is the other drug that is a, a newer one. It's a little bit more pricey, but um, less common in transplant medicine just because most patients will tolerate one of the other ones, but you do see it come up every once in a while. Um, the IL-2 receptor blockers prevent activation and proliferation of T-cells used for induction only. Uh, so we talked about these MAPs here, uh, very expensive, um, shown to significantly reduce rejection if you use them uh, for induction purposes. Uh, again, some organs, they don't recommend induction for, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, thought to work on active T cells only, so it kind of wipes out your active T cells, so it stuns your immune system, for lack of a better term. Um, adverse effects. The nice thing about injectable MABs is they really don't have a lot of effects other than what they're doing. So it's going to cause you to be immunosuppressed, sure, that's what you're trying to do with it. It's not really going to do anything else. MABs are very target specific, and they're only going to do what you want them to do, which is nice. They're really expensive, um, and they're really effective at it. Uh, they can cause uh, some hypersensitivity. So anything biologic that you ever inject in somebody always has a much higher risk of causing a hypersensitivity reaction than something that's an oral small molecule drug. So uh, that's just part of being a large molecule protein. It's an easier target for your immune system to attack and to kind of get that hypersensitivity type response. Um, some other agents, and we're getting into the weeds a little bit now, and I don't want you to know much about these. Um, rituximab, um, alamtuzumab, OKT3, radage is a thymoglobulin rabbit product. Um, there's bortezomab, which is approved for myel multiple myeloma. So there's a lot of different products on this slide. Point is, is that they're all used as um, adjuncts or augmentations for what we already talked about, or they're used for um, salvage therapy or induction therapy. So you aren't using these regularly in, in patients. So again, I don't really want you to know anything about them other than, you know, if you saw a MAB come up on the test, 
that's probably not a maintenance therapy drug, right? <laughs> so be able to recognize that those drugs wouldn't be given on a daily basis or wouldn't be part of a core regimen. That's really all I'd want you to know. Okay, so for the sake of discussion, just because I've talked about induction therapy a little bit, again, I won't test you on induction therapy. It's controversial and sites, um, transplant centers might vary depending on what they recommend for induction or whether they do induction therapy at all. <clears throat> for example, like a lot of sites don't induce patients um, aggressively for kidney transplant, but a lot of evidence would say prior to a heart transplantation, it is worth inducing some people. So again, you get differences even within the different organs that they transplant. Um, so your induction therapy, let's say you're good to go, you're usually going to use one of these products that we just mentioned, you're usually going to combine it with IV steroids, methylprednisolone, uh, and then you're ready for transplantation. So it's a one-time dose of each product. Uh, you go on under the knife, get your transplant, everything looks great. Um, your steroids are probably tapered down slowly while you're in the hospital recovering. Um, start your maintenance regimen here, monitor your patient at determined intervals. So your maintenance regimen, again, being your calcineurin inhibitor your antimetabolite and your oral steroid, or at this point, immediately post-transplant, probably an IV steroid still. Let's say you're a few months out of transplant, everything's looking good, you're on your three orals, um, you have some rejection occurring, you're going to treat rejection based on what organ it is. So different organs have specific protocols. Um, so hearts, for example, you treat much more aggressively right off the bat if there's any rejection. Versus kidneys, you might be a little bit more um, lackadaisical about your treatment. So for example, a kidney or liver rejection, uh, if your lab shows rejection, you adjust your maintenance regimen. So first things first, make sure that maintenance regimen is appropriate. Make sure the patient's taking it. Make sure the drug levels are good. Um, if all those things are, uh, if you can find an obvious smoking gun there, change it. Um, see how the labs trend. If that doesn't work or if the maintenance regimen looks fine, then you move to the heart algorithm, which starts a little more aggressive. Uh, so if biopsy confirms rejection, it's classified as mild. You treat with aggressively with steroids. Um, and if rejection is still present, you would move on to the next start, which is where we use some of these otter things. So we use the rad edge. Um, you could give IV tacrolimus or mycophenolate in these patients too, if you wanted to give them a boost of whatever um, basic uh, um, calcineurin inhibitor or anti-metabolite they're in. If rejection is still occurring, uh, you have the big guns. You can come in and try and wipe out their immune system to prevent it from, from happening. But um, ultimately, you work your way down that pathway. So again, I don't really care that you know all this stuff about how to prevent rejection. It's more of just like, what do we do when this process fails type of a thing? And knowing that um, some of the drugs have IV formulations, which helps out there. But that's really the, the moral of the story. I really want you to focus on the, the core three drug classes, um, and of course the steroids we talked about separately, but those would come into play here too, and the mTOR inhibitors, knowing a little bit about where those would be used as a replacement for, uh, for the test purposes. All right, uh, so just some transplant take-home points. Medication adherence and compliance is a really big deal. Um, people can't most people won't make it on a transplant list if they have a history of medication non-compliance because if they can't take the anti-rejection meds they aren't going to succeed and, um, medications are generally pretty expensive and there's a lot of them so people not only need to be adherent and compliant they need to have a system reminder they need to usually have some sort of medical insurance and coverage to be able to pay for this stuff um, so social work can have a huge role in these these types of cases and getting patients set up with the financial resources they need if they are, are uninsured. Uh, many additional drugs uh, to prevent adverse drug events. So you have your immune system suppressed chronically. So there's lots of stuff that can happen with that. Kind of like what George talked about a little bit with some of the HIV related things. Not to that extent, but you do get uh, people with more opportunistic infections. So mouth ulcerations and thrush, skin infections, malignancy, skin cancer, osteoporosis. Some things we might not treat all that differently, though. So, like, I I don't know, this is a while ago, but I had a patient come in who was a, a heart transplant patient, and he had a pneumonia, and I called our transplant coordinator because I wasn't sure if we'd treat him, like, more like a sepsis patient, you know, full broad spectrum everything, or if we just give him, like, Leviquin. And he's like, no, you can just use regular cap drugs. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So some things you don't really treat aggressively. Other things you might be a little more. It depends probably how sick the patient is. If they're really looking bad, you might want to be aggressive. If they're, like, you know, take home, you know, take home a drug uh, and get better at home, then maybe a, a, like a standard therapy would be fine. Uh, 
uh, frequent monitoring is required. Uh, most institutions have lots of protocols about monitoring and compliance and all this type of stuff and making sure that people are taking their medications and checking in every so often. So living kind of close to a transplant center is usually preferred or if not required uh, for a lot of these patients. Anybody have any questions about transplant medicine? Yeah. Is there any um, instances where you are able to interact with the healthcare and the regression medication that wants to have a hand time now without that? You're always on them, yeah. Yep. Sometimes I have seen people on like a dual therapy regimen occasionally, and I don't know for sure if that's because they just failed treatment on one and they decided this patient doesn't tolerate a class and we're just going to see if we can go with it. That's usually more common for kidney transplants if it is. So you might see people who might get off one, but it's pretty common to be on all three for life. Yeah. Yeah, more susceptible. The immune system isn't completely disabled, but it's you know it's not to the point where. Uh, but yeah, they are they are much more susceptible to like especially seasonal colds and things like that. So hand hygiene and things, being away from sick people, staying out of hospitals, that's just really important for. People who are chronically immunosuppressed. Would some of these drugs, like the mTOR inhibitor, would that be acting on other cells in the body besides CD4 too? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's targeted to the CD4, but certainly that could have implications beyond just solid organ rejection, right? Because you're you're interfering with the body's whole immune response. Yeah. But I don't know if that specific target exists on other cells or not. That's my question. Okay, well we're done early. So if you're if you're good with your test, don't really have any questions, you can feel free to go. If you want to stay after and ask me some questions, I'll stick around for again however long it takes. <laughs>